Well, as we all know, you're well known for being in the Vipers, Boomtown, Rats and the likes. Mm-hmm. What was it like getting started in Ireland? Not very easy. <laughs> I think probably the Rats and the Radiators, well, probably Till Lizzy before them, kicked open a few doors. And then the uh, Rats and the Radiators followed through after that. I used to go and see the Rats in Moran's Hotel destroying the place and I thought I had been rehearsing with a jazz rock band called No Buckets like played 20 minute instrumentals and then I saw the rats in, in Moran's hotel I thought now, this is more like what I want to do drink rock and roll I thought that'll do for me and then uh, having seen them I don't know two or three times in Moran's hotel um, I actually saw an ad in the, the old evening press now defunct and uh, rang this number and a voice on the other end said uh, how are you? my name is Geldof uh, I'm not very good at this kind of thing not very good at this kind of thing uh, we're looking for a drummer actually the, the, the ad in the, in the evening press said white punk on drums wanted for rock band which was in deference to was it the Tubes at the time the band called the Tubes had uh, an album out called white punks on dope or something like that so I auditioned for the Rats with 12, 13 other people, 12 other people I think it was. And I got the audition and I was rehearsed with them for a couple of months and travelled around with them. And uh, got a phone call. I, I actually think it was on Mike's birthday, the 17th of December one year. Fuck no, Kelly, their manager rang me up and said, uh, How are you Dave? Uh, Simon's decided he was he's coming back. Apparently he, he was going to go off and do a cabaret duet with his girlfriend. <laughs> My theory is that he, he found out before me that uh, they were signing a record deal. All right, so yeah. uh, the worst thing Fopman could have said was, uh, this is ever that we can do for you. Don't hesitate to call. So when that happened, I answered another ad in the paper. Someone wanted to form a band like the Boomtown Rats. So myself and a guy called Paul Boyle formed the Vipers. So having rehearsed with them, we then saw, again, the evening press, front page one night. Boom, damn rat sign, one million deal. It was like, box. <laughs> and uh, so I rang them, I had all their numbers, so I rang them up and said, uh, their first British tour was coming up. So I rang them up and said, hi lads, you know. Ah, oh, Dave, how's it going? And I said, grand, yeah, new band together, the Vipers, yeah. Guess who's supporting you on your British <laughs> tour? <laughs> and they said, oh, go on then. <laughs> So we got that tour and then via that tour we got introduced to Phil in it and we ended up doing the Black Rose tour in 1979 supporting Phil Lizzie, which was I think 32 dates over 7 weeks or something, it was mayhem. <laughs> actually we were told by, and I think it was actually Phil, late Phil Chevron, God bless him, they had done a support tour with Lizzie and we were told you're about to meet the biggest bollocks you're ever going to meet in your life, which was Phil in it. And we turned up late for the first night, as luck would have it, in Portsmouth. And their road manager was standing in the car park looking at his watch. And too late, we've another with a local band on, and Phil in it appeared with the ubiquitous large, I think it was Bacardi and Coke. How are you lads? A bit late. I think the tour manager's name was John Salter. And Lina goes, Get those fuckers off, the lads are here. And we were like, Great! But. The Lizzie audience was already in, so they had to take their gear off, and we had to set up in front of a partisan Lizzie <laughs> crowd going, that is how. We're like, <laughs> just be a sec. I think we got bottled off at least once on that tour. After which, and I wish we had a letter from Phil in it, said, uh, what I'll do for you is, is, I'll make a tape saying, these are me mates from Dublin that we could play beforehand. I wish we'd got it recorded, but we said, ah, oh, no, well, we're better than that. We can we can take it. Yeah. Gobshites, I mean, what, what would that be worth now? Yeah, fortune. <laughs> Here's my mates from Dublin called the Vipers. But uh, he did all sorts for us. One night he came in, I was one night he, he, he knew we were skimped, and he, he said as much to us, and he says, we're playing Manchester the next two nights. You can stay in my ma's place, I'll check it out. Because Philomena Limit used to have a hotel or bed and breakfast in Manchester. Yeah. So he got us put up 
for two nights there. I've spoken to her since and she said, yeah, you and everyone else, any, anyone who was anyone that fell in at you stayed in this mass <laughs> hotel in yeah. Manchester. Uh, one night he came into our dressing room and asked for one of our badges. We'd got badges made up, yeah. one of which I have somewhere. <laughs> and we were like, oh yeah, great, fill in it wearing one of our badges, fantastic. We didn't, didn't think of it. A couple of nights later we turned up somewhere, walked in and I think we decided to walk in the front door this night because we were getting fairly well known. So we decided to walk in the front door. We knew all the lads on the merchandise, busy merchandising stand. How are you lads? You know, grand, good to see you, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, up on the wall, was like 40 Vipers t shirts. And we're like, did you? No, it wasn't me. You know, our manager at the time, did, you know, Rody, like, no one knew what the fuck was going on. So we went up to the dressing room and Linnet walks in. Do you like your new t shirts, lads? We're like, this is the biggest bollocks we're ever going to make in our lives. He says, Yeah, you can keep it. If you sell any of them, you can keep the profits. I know you're a bit stuck for cash. It's like, <laughs> sound of them, yeah. I got you. I got you. I got you. Well, I have to say, listening to stuff like Soft Machine and Mahavishnu Orchestra. I definitely learned how to, I mean, I taught myself how to play the drums. Yeah. And listen to that stuff, you, you really had to know how to get around a drum kit, you know. But I'm more into three or four minute rock songs Verse, or pop yeah. songs or whatever, you know. Beginning, middle, end, rather than just, as I call it, musical masturbation. You know, I'm brilliant. Yeah, we know you're brilliant. You don't, don't keep proving it to us every <laughs> two seconds of every song. And so the shed at the bottom of my mother's garden was empty, so after I, what I told you about when I answered the, the ad, yeah. this guy Paul Boyle wanted to form a band. We formed the Vipers, and I thought, great, <laughs> well, we've <laughs> ready, ready made rehearsal room. <laughs> so uh, we immediately moved in there to the annoyance of most of our neighbours. So you said you taught yourself the drums? Yeah. How would you do that? Just, I used to. I bought first drum kit, Evening Press again. I know a lot of the Evening Press. I, got, I bought a second hand drum kit for 25 pounds which was a conglomeration of an Ajax and a Pearl kit and a couple of cracked cymbals. And what I did was, uh, probably why I failed the leavings there, uh, <laughs> it was actually the first day of my last year at school. And uh, every day for a solid year, what I did was, I'd put all my favorite albums on and put a pair of headphones on so you could hear the music and drums were so loud, you could hear them over the background. So I just, <laughs> Played along to all my favourite music and learned what it's. Oh, there's an interesting role, but you'd have to, in those days, you couldn't rewind. It was just li lift a, a needle and put it back to where. Yeah. Listen to that again, figure out how he did that. That's class. So I learned. Like, I can't, even to this day, I can't read music or speak drums. Like, you know, yeah. you should put a paradiddle in there. Oh, I'll put a fucking steak and guinea pie in there if you want. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> I'm I'm of the of the old school. You home it, I'll play it brigade. That's if I hear what happened once or twice, I could usually master it. The place John Murray, who's dead now, he dead a long time. He used to run the drum Dublin Drum Centre on Camden Street. I used to go in there and buy me sticks and whatever. So I said, well, I should get some lessons from you. And he says, Why? Do you enjoy playing? I said, I love playing. He says, Well, why do you want lessons? Because I don't know what this is called or that's called or. He says, well, why do you want to learn that? He says, if you come in here and get lessons from me, you're going to sound like me. Why do you want? Me? Why would you want to sound like me if you're happy playing the way you're playing? Yeah. So I never got lessons. <laughs> and I can't give lessons because I can't speak drum <laughs> either. Like, what's Smack that called? That I have no idea. Hit it harder, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're saying these are skins, so there wasn't much money in the industry then when you were playing no. around, though? It was no. just for enjoyment? I mean, I think we used to get like 10 punts for a gig between four or five of us, you know? Yeah. And you'd have to get there. And, I mean, picked up after that. Like, actually made more money with the mad band, like the Cajun Kings in the 90s. Yeah. I'd be doing six, seven gigs a week for like, you know, corporate dues and all this stuff. Playing complete shite. I mean, everyone was a good musician, if I can include myself. But <laughs> they were all very, like Paul Cleary from The Blades and uh, 
Come, Makati, Sean, Garvey, everyone had been in. Were you getting fairly well known in Ireland? Like, cause what was that like? Because people still to this day know who you are. Like, I say, mm. oh yeah, my uncle Dave, Dave Maloney, they're like, yeah. Although he used to, like, late 70s, the girl I was with walking down Gravel Street and every second person said hello and she actually said to me once, do you know fucking everyone in Dublin? I said, no. Just, you'd be in the papers every other day, you know, for wrecking some place or other. <laughs> so, we, no, we did get fairly well known. Sometimes for all the wrong reasons, but uh, we did play music as well, occasionally. Yeah, it sounds like a fun time to be involved in anyways. Oh, absolutely. My 21st birthday, I did a gig in lunchtime gig in Belfield UCD got, got arseholes drunk did a sound check in McGonagall's in town got drunk again went back to the gig can't remember a thing about it but I just presume it went well <laughs> probably destroy it there as well so yeah, that's kind of the way it went <laughs> <laughs> sounds good oh there's a million stories I'm sure there is a million that can't go on camera as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's gone well over the five minutes. Where did yeah. we check? <laughs> I think that's loads. Okay. Thank you for doing that. No <laughs> Thank you very much.